This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Nigel is an independent member of the House of Lords, where he co-chairs the all-party parliament group on global health, which has uh, 75 members of parliament and lords. We know him most importantly because he was the chief executive of the National Health Service in England, which he tells me is the fourth largest organization by employment, I gather not by spending, but by employment uh, in the world. And he was the permanent secretary of the UK Department of Health from 2000 to 2006, the only person to hold both jobs. The last seven years, he's turned his passion to global health, which is the uh, lecture today, uh, looking specifically at Africa and India, and more specifically on the problems of human resources. He's uh, developed partnerships with UK organizations and uh, specifically has looked at neglected topical diseases, tropical diseases. He's an author. Uh, he wrote the Global Health Partnerships Report for Tony Blair, uh, which laid out what the UK should be doing in global health. And this is essentially now what the UK does do in its policy. He's written books. Uh, the one that I first read was Turning the World Upside Down in Human Resources. It's, it's quite a well-known book in the global field. And more uh, recently, his Oxford Press book uh, called 24 Hours to Save the National Health Service. Uh, he's currently working on another book for Oxford Press, which will be coming out soon on the, uh, the role of African health leaders in determining their own destiny. Maybe he'd like to say a word about that. Uh, he has an enormous amount of affiliations. Uh, I'll skip them all, but I'll mention two. Uh, the, uh, the School of Public Health uh, uh, in London, where he's an honorary professor. He's a distinguished visiting fellow at Harvard. But most importantly now, his highest honor is he's now this year's Berkeley's Regents Lecture. So, absolutely. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much indeed for, for, for that, Richard, and that absolutely the, the, the last and finest honour is to be with you today. So I'm um, really pleased to be here. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk for about 40, 45 minutes, something like that, and then I hope there's plenty of time for discussion. Uh, and let me just say at the beginning that I think the discussion is the most entertaining point because I know what I'm going to say, um, and I'd really be interested to get in some discussion around this. Uh, a few very simple opening points. Um, I got involved, as, uh, as Richard just said, in, in global health because the then Prime Minister, a man called Tony Blair, whom I'm sure you will have heard of, um, three Prime Ministers ago now, I think, um, which is extraordinary, um, asked me when I retired from the NHS if I'd go and look and see what more we could do from the UK with our experience and our expertise to help improve health elsewhere. So not just our money, but the experience and expertise, the sort of people in this room, if I may put it like that. And I, I wrote him a report called Global Health Partnerships, which really said three things. The first thing, and sadly needs to be said every time, is stop telling people what to do and help them to do what they know they need to do and want to do. And we still need to do that. And those of you, and I, I see nods in the audience who've worked in a, in, a, in a lot of countries, will know that you come across the Brits who are trying to produce national health service type solutions to the problems in hand. And then you come across the Americans, and they're trying to put American type solutions in hand. Um, uh, and, and actually, people locally often know very clearly what it is they think they want. Um, the second big thing, and I say this in a great institution of learning like, uh, like Berkeley, is the biggest thing I think we can do um, from our rich countries is to support education and training uh, and building capacity in that way. 
um, the, shortage, the greatest shortage in healthcare around um, Africa, which I know better than, better than India, is actually skilled health workers. Not money, it's actually access to somebody who knows, has a degree of knowledge and expertise in healthcare, and that's really fantastically important. Um, and the third thing, actually, though, this is the subject of a lecture I'm doing tomorrow in the, uh, in, in, in the School of um, uh, Social Welfare, is how much we've got to learn. How much bright people without our resources and without our baggage and vested interests are innovating and developing things that we can really learn from. And that was the subject of my book, Turning the World Upside Down. It's the subject of the talk tomorrow. What I'm going to do today is, is a relatively simple story. And can I say at the beginning that it's really a work in progress, so I do, would like comments on it. But basically the work in progress is, is, is to sort of say, actually there's some fundamental change needed in health and healthcare globally. And I'll say what I think that is. But actually, an awful lot of people have got some pretty good ideas of what the answer might be. Um, or about what the steps are that we ought to be taking. And I suspect if I did a poll, I don't worry, I won't around this room, I'd have quite a lot of people talking about how they think healthcare sh could change. And there'd be quite a lot of overlap um, uh, around this room. But the problem is there's massive resistance to those changes. There's all kinds of interests which actually are opposing the sort of changes that need to be made. So what I'm arguing in this is there's some things we can do to help overcome that resistance. And I'll talk about that. And that's why I have this rather tentative uh, title, the three most promising areas in health globally, and I'll say what they are. Things that maybe will help get us past those, uh, the resistance to the sort of level of change we need. So let's start with the global context, if I can work this thing. Um, and the global context today, as people will be very well aware, um, is that if you're talking about health, the big issue is how interdependent we are. Uh, if I'd been running the NHS in the 1990s, I'd just have thought about Britain. I wouldn't have thought about what was happening outside. But we are interdependent in extraordinary ways. We're interdependent in the ways uh, that diseases travel around the world. I'm a European, so I have quite long history lines, and I know that in the 14th century, um, the Black Death, Death took three years to cross Europe. Uh, well, at the beginning of this century, SARS took three days to get around the world and was killing people on the other side of the world within three days. Um, we are extraordinarily vulnerable to the weakest point in the world um, uh, for where new diseases may come. We're vulnerable from climate change, interdependent on what happens to our neighbors um, uh, uh, and uh, uh, in, in terms of our environmental issues. Uh, we're interdependent as well um, in, in terms of the facts that we rely on the same groups of staff. We rely on the same drugs. We rely on a whole range of other things. So we're very closely tied together. We've also got a world where increasingly we talk about rights to health. They were actually first um, uh, set out, uh, weren't they, I think in 1946 or 8, 48 probably, um, uh, but increasingly people are talking about it. Yet given all that, there's an extraordinary tension that whilst we have got this interdependence and we've got these sort of rights to health and indeed rights to healthcare increasingly around the world, there are astonishing inequalities. Um, and I'll just show you a couple of slides on that. There are new threats, new health threats, and I'm thinking there of non-communicable diseases, which I'll talk about, but I'm also thinking of the new um, pandemic type things I've just talked about. But there are renewed threats. Uh, there's things like multi-drug uh, resistant TB, which people thought had gone away or seemed to think had gone away at one, at one stage, an extremely resistant um, uh, uh, TB. And of course, there's also the threats around antimicrobial resistance and, and, and the use of antibiotics and so on. So there's new threats, renewed threats uh, that we're facing. Um, and all of that adds up to an enormous amount to need to change, both in terms of how we think about health, but also how we deliver services, and both globally and locally. And the need to change globally, which I'm not going to talk very much about, um, if we are interdependent, if we have to tackle these global issues, then you get into some really interesting and difficult questions about how uh, can, can the sort of governance we have for health at the moment through the WHO and the UN, can it cope with that? Have we got the right partnerships? Have we got the right cooperation in place? Have we got the ability, if we've got this very unequal world, to help build capacity in those areas which need it? Have, uh, are we able to do that? Are we doing it? And have we got what I've already referred to, and as I say, I'll, I'll talk about tomorrow, um, is about have we got the ability to learn from each other and do what I call co-development. Um, I think we've, uh, I think we we'll probably need to move on from the world of international development, which is pretty much about 
the West telling other people how do things are done and that sort of way around to the sort of top down into something I talk about co-development and a recognition that we're really all this in, in this together. Having said we're all in it together, of course, this is a famous slide from 2006 um, from the uh, WHO report um, on working together for health, which, which brought was the one that really brought attention to the staffing issues in the world. And if I just use this to point out that there's Africa, which has about 10% of the world's population. It's got 25% of the world's burden of disease. And to deal with 25% of the world's burden of disease, it's got about 4% of the world's uh, health workforce. Yeah. Compare it with the Americas over here, which is North and South, um, which has got a not, uh, you know, it's got a, 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 a 10 or 12% um, uh, burden of disease, but it's got 35% of the health workers. This is a very, very unequal world on multiple dimensions. Roughly speaking, I, in, when I'm in England, I, I, if I use this slide, I talk about one of our great hospitals having 600 doctors. Um, and, and one of the big London hospitals having 600 doctors and having a massive burden of disease it deals with. If you were to translate that through into the sort of figures you're talking about in Africa, you'd be dealing with the same burden of disease in this massive hospital with about 12 doctors. Yeah, that's the sort of proportion. 50 to 1 is what you're talking about. Actually, here in the States, it's bigger. The, 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 the difference in terms of the workload. These are big differences. Uh, another very significant difference people will be very familiar with, uh, I perhaps people are familiar with these maps, which are um, uh, maps which actually show, you, show the size of the country by the burden of disease. Uh, there's a reference down here at the bottom. Uh, and you didn't need to know <laughs> that uh, HIV, AIDS, the burden of disease was in Africa. Um, and that, you know, uh, Europe and so on was uh, very, and were all really very skinny uh, in, in these sort of terms. So big differences that whenever we're talking about the fact that we're interdependent, we need to recognize. But those big differences also make big instabilities as the world changes and as power shifts around the world. However, there are also some very significant similarities. So let's go the right way. And here's a similar map. Uh, of something which um, uh, tends to get called non-communicable diseases. Um, and this shows the burden of non-communicable diseases. And it shows this great pink blob up here, which is um, the United Kingdom, appropriately fat and obese, um, full of diabetes and heart disease and, uh, and, and cancer and various other uh, non-communicable diseases. Shows North America perhaps not as fat as you might have thought it was going to be. Um, but... Um, <laughs> Uh, certainly not on the West Coast, I understand, is uh, obviously a very thin West Coast here. Um, it, it, it shows the extraordinary non the, the extraordinary impact of diabetes and, and, and heart disease in India, of course, which are for some slightly different reasons. Um, and even Africa. Africa is the, co is the continent where the fastest growth in diabetes is happening at the moment. Yeah? So this is genuinely a worldwide epidemic that's happening. Perhaps I should just say for the scientists and epidemiologists present um, that I am very well aware that non-communicable diseases and communicable diseases, there is overlap. And indeed, uh, that, um, uh, that uh, if you go to Ethiopia and look at the epidemic of diabetes in Ethiopia and you find it's among very thin African men who have a great deal of exercise, you'll know that actually uh, the disease may be different in different parts of the world. Nevertheless, having said that, um, uh, there is a very considerable movement towards us needing to deal with this sort of disease. And when you think about this disease, as people do, and again, as you, you all know, um, we need a different model of healthcare to deal with it. We're not talking about, we, we, you know, we, we, we did very well in the last century with our sort of hospital and physician-based services that we've got in the UK and we've got in the US in terms of dealing with um, uh, acute diseases and so on. But for the future, we know, uh, and I read it every time in your medical journals, uh, that we need to have a massive service change that will be much more community-based, much more home care-based, um, much more patient-led. Uh, we talk about in the UK as co-production, um, a much more self-care. Uh, we know that in a lot of the diseases we're talking about, patients or individuals are both part of the problem and part of the solution. Um, uh, and increasingly, this whole area of co-production is something which I'm going to come back to. Uh, we know as well that uh, we've got to cope much better with comorbidities as we live longer and as many of us get two or three um, long-term conditions. 
um, then actually we need to manage those rather than managing single diseases. Uh, we also know that science and technology will provide some uh, wonderful potential solutions to this and to change the way we deliver services. Um, and we also know that costs are driving change or will be a real trigger for driving change, particularly in your country, but actually in our country as well. Although it's an interesting point, isn't it, that I spend a lot of time in the West, and of course we're very worried about the costs of healthcare. And then I also spend time in India, and they're going to double their expenditure on healthcare in the next five years, according to their plans. You know? So actually, um, you know, there are people who are investing and growing, as well as those of us who are trying to hang on to what we've got and to, and to make cha change happen. So we know there's a massive need for, for, for service change. And we know that the sort of model we have to deliver healthcare at the moment in our country and in your country um, uh, doesn't work as well for these sorts of diseases. So we need to see that change happen. Uh, and the way you can see that it's not working is it manifests itself in this I don't know if people saw this. This was in JAMA in uh, 2012, I think. I can't actually see a date on there. Yeah, 2012. Um, and it was significant in... It's Don Berwick, who people will probably know from IHI, but also from... Um, uh, and, a, and a colleague, uh, uh, but also from being head of Medicare and Medicaid for, for a while. Um, and his estimate of the amount of theoretical waste that there is within the health system here in the United States, which is roughly 30 or 40 percent. And some of the big areas are failures to coordinate care, failures in care delivery, excess administrative costs. And some of these, I think, are just directly re the result of the fact that we're trying to use a model designed for something else, the acute diseases of the 1960s, 1970s, to actually take care of the diseases we have today in the, in the 21st century. And you get that sort of, uh, that sort of failure. Uh, another manifestation of the sort of failure we've got, if I press the right thing, um, is the variations in practice that you get. And again, I took an American example here. Rates of common surgical procedures among medical patients for 306 referral uh, regions, which shows very, very different rates in uh, the sort of uh, the, the, the variation in the number of hip fracture repairs, relatively low variation, but the numbers of radical prostatectomies, uh, very large variation, all of which beg questions about so what is this system doing? What, uh, you know, how scientific is this? Um, are these reasonable variations? And maybe they are reasonable variations or are they unreasonable variations? So we know that we've got a really serious problem and significant problem uh, that we should be dealing with. We also know, uh, and, and again, this has come from your country very much, this notion of having the triple aim that actually what organizations need to be focusing on is population health, at the same time as individual health and at the same time as reducing costs and waste. Um, actually, coming from Europe, it's slightly surprising that this is a new idea because our, when, we, when you have a budgeted health service like a national health service, you're actually trying to develop, improve population health and individual patient care, and you're trying to do so within a, within a particular pocket of money anyway. Um, but I think it's a very valuable concept and has moved us, fur uh, moved us further. But the trouble is that when one is thinking about how you make the sort of massive changes that um, I have outlined very simply here towards the sort of community and home care, towards much more patient co-production and self-care, comorbidities and continuity, dealing with those and so on, um, and how you move towards the, tri the, the triple aim, um, there are some problems because actually there are people who have huge investment in the status quo, um, all of us probably, um, and I identify five areas there, four areas plus one final comment. Um, uh, all of these are things which are both good and bad. National self-interest, to some extent, stops us developing the right sort of governance globally that will enable us to uh, deal with the sort of big issues that we've talked about. Uh, and there's lots of interesting examples of that. Professionals, the medical professionals, the nursing professionals, fantastic gains that have come from the way that professionals have worked over the last century. Uh, absolutely extraordinary. But to some extent as well, the professions can be the barriers to the sort of change that we're talking about and not giving up um, some of their power uh, to other people within the system. Commerce and markets, well, you know, you can argue that uh, drug development has been very much led by, by commercial industry and there's been some great gains that have come from uh, commercial enterprise. Uh, but equally, and here in the US you know it better than I do, uh, the, the issues of commerce and markets get in the way as well of the development of new 
uh, and, and different ways of uh, developing healthcare, particularly things that are more focused towards prevention and stopping disease, uh, as opposed to things which are focused with, with the treatment of disease. Governments and regulators, both have been very helpful in, in, in developing more safe practices, but can also stop innovation um, uh, and be barriers to change. And all of this leads, as, as people try to move from one model of healthcare to another model of healthcare, it leads to the most extraordinary complexity and complications. And when I look at what's, what's happening in your healthcare system, I don't know how many of you understand exactly what's happening with Obamacare. Uh, uh, somebody put their hand up. <laughs> <laughs> perhaps, perhaps they didn't. Um, but you know, if I were to ask a similar group of people in the UK as to whether we really understood what was happening in the NHS, and what's happening is we're, we've, we've got this model and we're twisting it to try and fit the new situation. Um, rather than starting somewhere else, and we keep adding complication. And part of the problem, and I know this because I used to run a health system, is that the people at the top of these health systems quite like complications. They're all nice, bright people, and they quite like, you know, finding the next little wrinkle that will actually make things happen. Um, so I'm as guilty as anybody else. So we've got ourselves into a situation where all the things I've got on the, here are both great enablers of change and great barriers to change. Uh, and the way we're tackling it at the moment simply isn't radical enough. Um, so I ask myself, where are the other sources of power? Where are the people who might actually start to make change happen? And where are they making change happen? And I would identify three areas um, that are really significant. The first one is citizens and communities, deliberately not saying patients, uh, though we'll come back to that. Um, second one is health workers. Third one is science and technology. And I'm going to go through these three uh, each in turn. Let me kick off with citizens and communities. And once you start to look at what is happening around the world in terms of things like uh, uh, patient power, uh, patient in, in empowerment, citizen empowerment and so on, you find a most interesting and a remarkable range of examples. Many of them here in the US, um, but not yet it seems to me joined up. And I'm just going to run through a few very quickly. You have expert patients programs here in, in, in the US. In fact, you, de you developed the first ones which are now spreading around the world, uh, which is, again, people I'm sure know are people, for, ex for example, with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, um, who, because they are experts in their own disease, are able to help other patients with that disease and indeed help to train staff um, who are dealing with that disease. Uh, in developing countries, you have what is called Mothers to Mothers, um, which is 250,000 women in, in five countries in, in, in southern Africa um, who have got AIDS, HIV, have got HIV, um, and who are working with mothers-to-be with HIV um, to help them to make sure that they don't transmit it to their children. Yeah? It's a very much an expert patient sort of approach, um, of, uh, but in the field of prevention. You've got an extraordinary example of, uh, of people doing things for themselves, uh, I'm just going to give you this story about uh, blood transfusion in Sweden, uh, which some of you may be familiar with. Um, but there's a, a hospital in Sweden called Jönköping, uh, in the center of Sweden, where about 60% of the patients come into the hospital at whatever time they want and hook themselves up to the blood transfusion system and do the transfusion themselves. Um, and it all started about six or seven years ago um, because a young man who happened to be a Volvo engineer um, said, I know about hydraulics, and with physicists in the room, and we, uh, uh, you know, I know about hydraulics, so why can't I do this myself? And the Swedish uh, doctors and nurses, to their great credit, said, well, why don't you? And so they trained him to do it. And then other, after that, other people started to do it. And actually, if you've ever had dialysis, I understand I haven't, it is one of the most debilitating things that you can have. And if you have, need to have it at three times a week and you have to fit in with somebody else's schedule when you're having the dialysis, this is even more debilitating. So they've now got a system where effectively they've got a room like this um, on the edge of the hospital and you've got a swipe card if you're a patient, if you've done the training, and you come in when you want to come in and you hook yourself up. Um, you don't have to do it. 60% of the patients choose to do it. Um, and the result of that is, as you can imagine, quality improves. There's no chance of cross-infection because you're doing it yourself. Um, uh, and actually, it's cheaper. And it's a really interesting example of patients pushing the barrier as to what they're doing as opposed to stuff that we think we have to do um, from the provider side. I actually visited that with a group of Americans. Um, and you know what the first question was they said to the Swedes? They said, uh, what did your lawyers say? 
Uh, and, the law, and the Swedes replied, um, they said, we're Swedes, <laughs> you know, uh, our lawyers work for us, we don't work for our lawyers. <laughs> so forgive me with the anti-American joke, as it were, but, uh, but it's a really interesting one, because actually it takes pretty brave people to actually say we're willing to do that. I know you have transfusion in people's own homes, but that's a different setting uh, as we do, but to come into the public setting and to do that, and, uh, and it's starting to spread, uh, it's starting to spread around Europe. Um, it's starting to happen in the UK now as well. Um, so I use that as an example because it's a nice example of the fact that actually patients can do a lot more than we think they can. And, uh, and actually, sorry, we can do a lot more than our clinicians think we can, if I may put it uh, 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 another way around. Um, and you get the same interesting thing in Africa where you have community health workers who are very often village women um, who with a little element of training are not only looking after their own family, uh, but the ones in Ethiopia, for example, can do about 20 things. Ten of them that are effectively about public health type things, prevention, and 10 of them that are effectively curative type things. Um, and they can do them, and actually they do them very well. And the biggest problem with them doing them is that the professionals at the next level um, don't respect them and don't accept their referrals properly. Really interesting point about the future. Another interesting stuff that we are doing with patients around the world, you, you see it in, in, in low middle income countries, you see it in, come, came from Mexico, um, uh, as I recall, conditional cash transfers, which uh, effectively was about um, withholding social benefits to people until or unless they did things that were health improving, um, such as taking their children to school, I think, in, in some cases, but, 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 but also um, maternity care or whatever. Um, in the UK, we've now got a programme of personal budgets so that for, for people who are seriously disabled and are going to be seriously disabled for the rest of their life, we give them the budget um, if they want to. They don't have to take it, but we give them the budget if they want to. Um, and this may be a big budget. This may be a few hundred thousand pounds. You know? uh, and, this is, uh, and they then are entitled to employ their carers. And by carers, I mean the people who come into their home to wash them and, and help them to go to the loo or... Or, or, or whatever and all of that. And, they, uh, and that is very much more empowering. And they also have some discretion about how they spend the money, so that actually they've got choices. Um, because actually, if you're seriously disabled, some things may matter to you that don't matter to somebody else who's got the same condition. Uh, indeed, it reminds me of a very important point from my friends in, in the Institute for Healthcare Improvement on the other side of this great country, a, a woman called Maureen Bisignano, who some of you will know as the president there. And she says that, you know, the second question that doctors need to ask, and some do, if the first question is, what's the matter with you? The second question is, what matters to you? Um, really interesting point if you've got Parkinson's disease or something like that, which may manifest itself in a whole range of different symptoms, um, and you can't control them all. So which are the ones that are going to be really important to you? Uh, and I'll come and say something in a moment about a Parkinson's disease, which is why I use the example uh, program in... Um, in um, Holland uh, called Parkinson's Net, which effectively has the patients and the, um, well, in fact, the guy, the, the doctor running it refused to call them patients, um, the people <laughs> and, and the clinicians using the same network of knowledge, um, uh, making decisions in real time, uh, virtually as well as face to face. Um, and he asked, his, he asked his diabetes, he asked his Parkinson's patients to rank 10 things in order of what was most important to them. And the things were things like, you know, walking, not drooling, being able to eat, whatever, sleeping or whatever. Uh, and he asked them to rank them. And the top three, the top two, which were totally unexpected, were wanting to have sex and being able to sleep. And this was, this was not where the clinicians um, <laughs> would have placed them. Um, so some very interesting stuff there about that. Uh, and then you've got community mobilisation. We've now got in the UK uh, communities communicating, uh, uh, mobilising around trying to control and reverse the growth in diabetes, um, which means pharmacists and, uh, uh, and schools and the local shops and other people all working together about trying to deal with the things that project diabetes. Uh, and again, you've seen, I would just take a very simple example in Uganda, uh, where, there's been, where there was before and the antiretrovirals were available in Africa, there was some very impressive work done about mobilizing the community to um, stop the, um, 
the, the increase uh, in HIV AIDS. And all of that, of course, fits into a much bigger agenda, which is about governance for health, and which is about what's the role of the citizen in deciding what happens, what are the roles of the various different um, areas of, uh, uh, of our life that are connected with health. So there's a very, very big movement here um, that is actually independent, or needs to be independent, of those other power bases I talked about. Uh, let me jump across to uh, the next area, which is, of course, health workers. Um, and uh, health workers where, uh, again, you can see people really changing things, shaping what's happening in real time all over the place, developing new roles, changing what we call skill mix in the UK, what is tends to be called um, task shifting in Africa. I'm not quite sure what it's called here. Um, but in general, it's people are, are thinking about doing things which traditionally, i.e. for the last 50 years, have been done by doctors, having them done by nurses, or stuff done by nurses being done by uh, other people or whatever, uh, and education and training. And this is an area where people are really uh, breaking an awful lot of the rules as they used to be. Um, and this is developing very fast, and it's developing faster, of course, in low and middle income countries. Uh, it was mentioned earlier that I chair something called the All-Party Parliamentary Group on global health, which is down here, which is 75 MPs and Lords interested in global health. Well, together with the Africa All-Party Parliamentary Group on Global Health, uh, of Parliament, All-Party Parliamentary Group, uh, we set out to have a look at, you know, where there was skill mix changing around the world. And this is a global phenomenon. Um, it really is. It has examples from the UK of nurse, nurses doing prescribing. Um, which happened in my time as, as chief executive uh, and making some really significant changes. It has some very interesting changes, for example, in Mozambique, uh, where when Mozambique became independent in 1974, basically all the doctors left. They went back to Portugal. Uh, and the then, uh, or the, the, the Minister of Health who arrived in 1976, a man called Pascual Macumbi, um, uh, then set up a program for training nurses, in effect, uh, technica de Cirugia, um in um, doing obstetric sections, doing C-sections, doing uh, obstetric uh, um, surgery in the rural areas. And even today, and this is whatever it is, 25, 30 years later, almost all the caesareans outside the capital are done by nurses with additional training. And they are done to the same standards as for, and the same complication rates as by physicians. Um, and, of course, they're done at about half the price. Um, and the nurses stay in the country, whereas the doctors migrate uh, mostly to South Africa or some to Brazil. Um, and it's a really challenging example for us because it's been written up in peer-reviewed journals in the West. You know, this is not just an anecdote. This is 25 years. Um, and all the things we count as evidence count as evidence to show that these nurses are doing it just as well as the doctors are. Um, now, I'm not suggesting that here in, in, in Berkeley you should institute a movement for caesareans or in UCSF to, uh, uh, to, to, to be done by nurses. Um, but having said that, this makes you think about what else you might be doing. Now, what we did as, a, as an all-party uh, parliamentary group is we, we looked at these because one of the things that people in the audience will be thinking is that, yeah, okay, you're picking out some examples that have worked, but actually an awful lot of these examples haven't worked. Lots of people have tried to pass things on to community workers, pass things from doctors to nurses. So what are the success factors? So we identified some success factors. And they were what we would call in English the bleeding, sim the bleeding obvious. Um, they start from the basis that, of leadership and planning. You know? Make sure somebody's in charge and decide what it is you're going to do and plan it. Make sure you design the job properly and then recruit the sort of people who can actually do it. Not every nurse is going to be a prescriber in England. Not every nurse in Mozambique is going to be able to uh, do surgery. Um, make sure there's formal training and there's progression. People can pr get promoted. Make sure there's supervision and there's referral. Unlike the Ethiopian example, which, where they've run into this problem that they've got these excellent community health workers, health extension workers at, at the most local level, but actually the next level up, the professionals, don't accept the referrals because they think they're just village women. Uh, uh, really interesting point. Uh, and look at recognition and teamwork. And these are the success factors. And every example that we looked at that was successful, these very simple, obvious, organizational management stuff, common sense, difficult to do 100% of the time, but important things were the ones that were successful. Uh, <clears throat> if, of course, you happen to think that the skill mix is a bad idea, 
then this is the recipe for failure. Uh, make sure that any skill mix program that you set up, make sure there's lack of leadership and planning, make sure there's poor job design and recruitment, no formal training progression, inadequate supervision or referral, uh, and insufficient re re uh, recognition or teamwork. It really is that obvious. Now, having said that, I've actually described it here as the risk of failing, um, because actually, in some countries and in some conditions, you can't get these things right. You know, it's actually very, very difficult to maintain a proper formal training and progression. But this is what, you, but you know, the other way up is what you've got to aim for. Now, all of that's really very important as starting to say that actually you can um, identify really significant changes in skill mix. And if you think not here in, in, in America, where your big question is how you're going to pay for it, but if you think about India, how are you going to provide healthcare in a million villages? Africa, how are you going to provide healthcare in a, in, a, in a million villages? It's not going to be the staffing structures we're talking about. It's going to be really very different. And so you need to be thinking about this. And then the other thing that you need to be thinking about, of course, is that in all of that, um, my observation, having worked in health for 25 years, is that health changes when it changes in the ph physicians and the nurses' heads. You know, once people get a different vision in their health, in the, their heads and their minds and their passion. And you see people all over the place doing things because they're convinced, they're passionate, they want to change. And how can you change professional education to make sure you produce even more of those fantastic uh, clinicians? Because I should say, uh, and not just to the doctors in the audience, that almost all those skill mix changes that I pointed out were led by clinicians and mostly doctors. Um, and Pascal McCombie, the man in Mozambique, is a doctor. Um, uh, uh, you know, so, you know, the clinicians are the people, the health workers are the people who really make, uh, make these things happen. Uh, and therefore, you need to be thinking about new uh, professional education. I won't go into this in, in any detail, but this was a, uh, a Lancet Commission on the Future of Professional Education, in which um, Jaime Sepulveda and I were both members, uh, under the chairmanship of Julio Frank and, and, and Lincoln Chen. Um, and, um, a very interesting group of people they brought together, which essentially, which is quite a complicated report, but I'm only going to pull out two single, single points about it. Um, and the first point about it is that in terms of professional education, uh, we have moved from, in the 1900s and with Flexner, the 1910, the introduction of the scientific curriculum, um, which was a very university-based um, and science-based approach to medicine, which is still there. But we moved further uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the middle of the century to a much more problem-based focus in, 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 in medical education, based in academic centers, much more problem-based, um, building on the scientific one. And what the argument that uh, we're making in that report is that the new uh, professional education needs to be much more systems-based so that the new doctors of the future, the new nurses of the future, understand not only the science behind it, not only how it manifests itself in the individual person, but also how it manifests itself in the system and how you have to work with the system to actually make change happen at any scale. Um, and we argue in that report, um, and this is the second thing I'd pull out from it, um, that there are three levels of learning uh, for professionals, starting at the top with basically the informative level where people are acquiring information and skills and become experts. Secondly, the formative level where people get socialized and acquire the values and become, and become professionals. But that actually the area we need to, the professionals to be in the future in this very different workforce is transformative. They need to have the leadership attributes and they really need to be the change agents. Um, and that the role for the professionals in the future is in actually leading that team which is not just transprofessional, um, but is actually is not just transdisciplinary, but is transprofessional and engages everyone on that curriculum from patient, if you like, to um, lay health worker to partly trained health workers to the various sorts of professionals. So my arguments there are that on uh, are that in the the staffing area there's some very big changes underway, and what I think is already interesting is there's a number of schools that we, uh, and that report indicates, that are already in this area and are training different sorts of professionals for the future. Let me move on then to the third part, very simply and very quickly, onto science and technology. Um, and science and technology is empowering citizens. Um, you, I think, in America have probably got some of the best examples in the world, in the world only bettered by Africa and India. 
uh, where because they don't have uh, wires and so on, they're actually doing stuff in some very interesting ways. Um, I've already talked about empowering citizens. If anyone ever wants to look up Parkinson's Net, it is actually in English as well as in Dutch. Um, uh, and it is a fantastic source and resource for Parkinson's patients in Holland, and it is a methodology through which they are linking um, people um, uh, uh, across, the entire, um, uh, across the entire country with Parkinson's disease. Um, equally clearly, uh, science and technology enables health workers. The electronic health record is, is going to be very significant in the future. And it also enables these sort of global partnerships, the, the, the sort of fact that an isolated clinician somewhere in Africa can get help and can be talked with and talking with somebody in, uh, in UCSF or wherever to gain support. And it's also starting to improve service. Uh, and make real change. And here in telemedicine, you see most, uh, you see an awful lot of very interesting examples developing around, uh, particularly, as I say, India and Africa. I'm going to dwell on one, and I'm going to tell you two more stories before I stop my bit uh, and we get on to conversation. The first one is this one, which is called, uh, rather unsexily, the whole system demonstrator. Um, it was a, an experiment which was set up in the UK about five years ago. Um, it was a randomized controlled trial. Very simple randomized control trial. 3,000 summing patients here in the control group, 3,000 in the trial group. Um, and the people in the trial group were going to access their services and be monitored electronically. So whoever you were, you, you could have your vital signs monitored at home and put through to a center somewhere. And if you wanted help, um, you could ring somebody up or get them on the internet or whatever. And actually, the, the trial didn't specify the type of technology. You and your doctor decided what technology you wanted to use, which I think was quite an interesting point as well. Um, and it ran for 18 months. So you had 3,000 in the trial group, 3,000 in, 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 who used the NHS in the traditional way. And what happened at the end of it was some, was, was some obvious results, or results you'd think you'd get, uh, such as the fact that people in the trial group, uh, in the trial group who were monitored at home, um, didn't uh, use the hospital, anything like as much as anybody else. There were f much fewer admissions. I think it was 15% fewer admissions, something of that sort. Um, uh, and there was fewer use, smaller use of the emergency department. Uh, it was also a bit cheaper, not significantly cheaper, but a bit cheaper. Um, but the thing that was really very, very significant was that the, the change in mortality. Mortality was 40% lower in the group who were monitored at home. You can sort of imagine that that might be the case if people are catching things earlier because you're monitoring them at home, but 40% was a big number. In 3,000 people, it wasn't very many people, <laughs> you know, so actually, you know, but, but it was statistically significant from, uh, from, from what everyone said. Now, that is a real challenge to everybody within the system. Um, it's a real challenge to hospitals. It's a real challenge to, um, uh, to, to the way staff work. It's a real challenge to the way people have worked. It's a real challenge to the boundary between what the patient does for themselves and what the, what the clinician does for themselves and so on. Um, and um, uh, what's happened in the UK is, is that there is still a lot of analysis going on. Uh, my reading of this is that you need to do some more research to understand really what's going on and to get at the detail of this and to see what's really happening, and you need to do that over a period. But my reading of it as well is that there's enough there to indicate this is worth continuing with. Um, this is really interesting stuff, and in fact the government, because governments always, no, this is unfair, governments don't always look at the evidence in any great detail. I, I observe. Is that a fair comment from the... Uh, from those of us who've worked directly with government and those of you who've been influenced by government. Um, and, and so in the UK, we've actually um, are now putting three million people into this. You know, we're actually going to, we've identified three million people who we think will benefit from this monitoring program at home um, with the intention of making some really big impacts. So that's what's going to be happening over the next few years. So my point there about science and technology is, um, is that there's an awful lot going on. Now, I want to try and bring these things together because actually I think the really important stuff is when you actually can get these three things shifting together, patients doing much more and just taking it, taking the space, staff breaking the rules, if you like, and shifting the boundaries, which is easier to do in less regulated countries than the US. Um, and then technology, which is also breaking up some of our other boundaries. Let me give you one terribly simple example, which I, I'm very fond of, uh, which involves um, uh, community-directed treatment in Africa, just to take you into Africa just for a moment. Um, 
Some of you, many of you will know that there's a, a disease called onchocerasis or river blindness, dreadful disease where basically uh, you get bitten, something travels up inside you and, and bites your optic nerve and you're blind. And there are villages in Africa which were where almost everyone over the age of 25 was blind. Um, you know, dreadful thing, affects a large number of people. You can prevent it. You can prevent it by breaking the life cycle of the, uh, of the parasite. Um, and you can do that with a drug called ivermectin, um, which was ori originally uh, uh, developed by Merck, I believe, for deworming dogs. Um, uh, but what Merck did 25 years ago, 26 years ago, they said that we were, they, they discovered that it worked against um, um, uh, onchocerasis. Uh, and they said that we will give it free for as long as it takes. Uh, so I do pay tribute to Merck in doing that. So they are providing ivermectin free everywhere in the world. I happen to chair an organization called Sight Savers, which as its name implies, works with blindness um, in 35 countries around the world. Um, and our task is how do you reach 26 million people in Africa? How do you reach 26 million people in Africa to give them this pill? And think about Africa, think, uh, think about not you know, Nigeria, there's not, not the cities, but think about the whole of Africa. And remember that the size of Africa. Uh, you, you, you know that our globe shows Africa the wrong size. You can fit India, the whole of, North, whole of Europe and the whole of North America into Africa. You know? It doesn't look it on the globe, but actually that's just the projection. Africa is huge. Um, it has well over a million uh, uh, villages. We are, uh, the, a thing called the African Partnership for Onchocerasis uh, Control um, has one million community distributors in 133,000 villages around Africa. And these are people, and I'll show you a picture of one. These are people, like him, you know, uh, and they are making sure that everyone in their village is um, given a pill once a year. And if you can do that to everyone in the village for 10 years, you've got rid of it locally. That that's counts as uh, elimination. It's a big task. You could not do that sort of thing with the sort of health system that we've got in, in, in the UK or the US and transpose that across into that sort of environment. It's fantastic. It's, it reaches these people. Um, it's public and private. Um, because as I said about the, the drugs that have been involved, it's got N INGOs involved like Sight Savers. It's scientifically demonstrated to work, not only the methodology, but also obviously the drug, and it's technology enabled. And I thought I'd finish just by showing you uh, the technology. The first bit of technology is in his left hand, um, and it's a fantastic piece of technology. It's a stick, um, and up, up to here it's white. Um, and then you can see a red bit with a white dot, and then you can see another bit, yellow bit with two dots, a blue bit with three dots, and a green bit with four dots. And you can work out what this is for, can't you? Um, well, you need to give different numbers of pills to smaller people than bigger people. So you stand this next to them. <laughs> and if you're only a little fella and you come up to the red, you get one pill. If you're, if you're a giant, you get four, um, uh, you know, four at the top there. Isn't that a fantastic bit of technology? <laughs> Perfectly designed. Um, and I partly tell that story because the only other bit of technology that program really uses, um, which is behind him, is, 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 is not his register in front of him, but that for every one of these 100,000, there are a number of people who are then mapping what's going on. And they map it directly into their iPhone and onto the cloud. So you have got the iPhone and the cloud, and you've got the painted stick as the technology of the future, as the metaphors for the, for the technology of the future. But my whole point is that actually, once you, you, you know, that was about people thinking very differently about how they need to do it. And it is community directed. It really is um, a, as an interesting program. So somewhere along the line, I'm arguing that you need to have what I call uh, triple gain, which is the intersection of citizens and communities grabbing power, as they already are doing, health workers individually and not necessarily as professions, breaking, pushing the rules as health workers have always done, you know, uh, you know, pushing the, the, the barriers out to make change and science and technology. And somewhere we need to try and harness these three things. Um, and I say this very deliberately as a slight antidote to some of the things I hear around uh, healthcare globally, which is about economic measures. These are all about service delivery measures. These are all about people doing things as opposed to changing the way that the money flows around the system. 
Um, and these are, seem to me to be the three things that are going to bring us the biggest change in the future. And that fundamental to them is, is both him, but fundamental to them is that we need to get people together. We need to get the people, professionals, and science working together. We need to make this much more visible, the sort of changes that people can make. We need to have many more um, exchanges and learning. We're lucky in Europe. It doesn't take us very long to go to a foreign country. <laughs> Here in the United States, it takes you a long time to get to a foreign country, um, uh, um, uh, generally, whereas actually we're, we're all much more engaged in, in, in foreign countries. Uh, but actually, my observation when I was running the NHS is I used to encourage doctors and nurses to go and work in Africa for a bit or work in India, because they came back refreshed. They came back with different eyes. They came back seeing the world in a, in a different way and, and, and made a bigger contribution in the UK. Um, so I think we need to develop many more of these sort of exchanges and mutual learning. And I know that you as a community here are, of course, a global community um, uh, in, in every way. And we need fundamentally to change the way in which we educate and train professionals. Thank you very much. Hi, Nancy Padian. So Hi. one thing that you didn't deal with explicitly, but maybe you meant implicitly, is the failure to have widespread scale up of solutions that we know work. And so, for example, we work in circumcision, there's cervical screening, vaccination programs. And I was wondering if you thought sort of the trilogy of your three uh, I'm not, I, are they the, I honestly forget if they're the gains or the aims, but in any case, yeah. whether that trilogy would sort of, sort of in, um, take care of that, or if there needs to be some sort of more explicit way that we can make that happen. Uh, well, things fail for different reasons is, 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 is part of the issue here, and I, and I hope the Dean will also come in on this answer as, uh, 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 as well from, uh, you know, from, from your wide experience of looking at, looking at programs. Um, I do think it will be very helpful because actually I think um, uh, these are all cultural things, you know? These are cultures of, of, of whether you think you are completely dependent on the outside for help. Very interesting in, 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 the, um, in the example I gave of river blindness, uh, those are all volunteers, you know? They get a certain degree of prestige in their village for being volunteers. And real conflict came about, or, or, uh, or has come about in a number of examples, where we have come in, and by we I mean Americans and Brits, and we are trying to line up volunteers to distribute other drugs, and we're going to pay them. You know? So actually, in some cases, that stopped these volunteers from working. And Africans, not us, not Americans and, and, and Brits, had to go to fellow Africans and say, look, this is about the community. This is, this is about us. This is about how we make it happen. And that's, that's really quite an interesting tension between something like that, which I think is a, is a cultural thing and, and is about Africans helping Africans, as opposed to things that are coming in from outside. And, and I think some of that may well be uh, a tension. But the other bits are cultural too. It's, you know, the stuff about who the health workers are and so on is, is also cultural. And part of our difficulties, um, it, and I know, thinking from the British government point of view, is that we may design programs in Whitehall that look jolly good, <laughs> but actually they may not quite fit. Uh, and, and, and again, uh, working with the, with the local culture, both in terms of the people but, um, and so on. And of course, you know, this, all, this is all true in America. It's all true in the UK, isn't it? You know? I mean, how, what, what are the figures on drugs? It's 30% of, uh, uh, of prescriptions are not taken in the way that the physician expected you to do. It's for the same sort of reasons. I, some of it's about money, I'm sure, but you know, it, it, th th these are similar sort of reasons as to why our large-scale health programs uh, don't work, I suspect. But what, what do you think, Steph? I mean, is it in response to her question about what's... Uh, well, I, I mean, I, I was very interested by the, the sort of three opportunities you talk about, yeah. and I was, I think, perhaps most interested in the degree to which they overlap. Yeah. So, for example, what communication technology is doing to the enabling of communities. Yeah. Um, you know, what we saw in the Arab Spring yeah. um, in communications, if you sort of mm. migrate that kind of transformational effect to health, it means that Parkinson's patients, whether they're in Malawi or in Holland, yeah. can access the same database, can yeah. uh, have a way to network, even when the local density is low, yeah. the global density is high. Yeah. And it creates those kinds of transformative effects. And 
that has similar effects on um, people's awareness of and yeah. ability to compare performance yeah. of their local whatever to, yeah. to benchmarks and standards elsewhere. Mm -hmm. And that happens like that, yeah. right? I mean, uh, you know, I worked with Jaime for many years in Cuernavaca. Mm -hmm. um, it used to be that it made a big difference whether you yeah. had access to the Harvard Medical Library or not. Yeah. And that had to do with whether you lived in Boston or not, or could yeah. get there or not. Yeah. But now, when, once the internet came along, yeah. it didn't matter whether you were in Cuernavaca or in Boston, you had access to the same library. Yeah. And um, now with the networking and communications possibilities around things like Parkinson's disease, to take your yeah. example, those differences, distances disappear. Yeah. And uh, um, which means if you have the, my area of HIV, mm -hmm. if you can achieve, if um, Rwanda can achieve 89% viral suppression uh, with antiretroviral treatment, then there's no reason that Zambia can't or, or Mumbai can't. And yeah. if you aren't, then yeah. why not? And yeah. how can you learn from the other? So you know, I think some of those things are terribly I th important. I think the overlap, is, as you say, because in the Parkinson's disease example, it wouldn't, have been, it wouldn't have happened unless the doctor had taken a different view of his role fundamentally right. different view. He wasn't just a guy, a specialist who patients came to and he proclaimed. He was somebody who, who was out there with his patients and not calling him patients and working, working with them. I'd like to thank all of you who've um, come out at the end of the day, and I'm sure many of you have people waiting at home. And I'd like to thank Lord and Lady Crisp for making the trip across the Atlantic and for not just tonight and what's been a very interesting um, presentation and discussion, but for the 10 days that you're giving us and the various and sundry meetings that you're doing. I know you're going to UCSF shortly mm. with uh, Jaime's team. And just thanks very much to both of you. Great. Uh, thank you. Mm. Very good. Mm.